Atheist Nomads, episode 109, Genetic Engineering with Amber Sherwood K. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 109. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And joining us today is Amber Sherwood K. Amber, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yay. So, yeah, uh, geographically, I, th- I think you're the the closest to me of any guest we've ever had on the show, yet it's only taken us three years to get you on. <laughs> if I had a very good throwing arm and a rock, I might be able to hit your house from here. That is a true. Wow. Man. <laughs> That's pretty damn oh, close. Boy. Well, he's across the water, but it's a very narrow bit of water. Yeah, yeah it ain't bad. <laughs> yeah, I bump into you way too often, but it's all good. <laughs> and for those of you confused, Bremerton is a small town. Oh, yeah. Small little uh, Navy town. Hey, we got it like 40,000 people. If the ships are in. Yeah. Yeah. It goes down by 10,000 if the uh, if the aircraft carriers are at sea. <laughs> and apparently, once they come in, all of the OK Cupid uh, accounts in Bremerton just go silent. <laughs> yeah, so I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is totally a thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, and I think Bremerton has the distinction of having the most regularly variable population by percentage. Pretty there much. might be some colleges that have college towns that have a, a slight edge on you, but at least for for the size of the city, pretty damn good. Well, that's pretty much any t- Navy town. Uh, Honolulu, I'm sure. Uh, well, Pearl. Honolulu is a lot bigger than Bremerton. And it also probably doesn't have... I mean, Bremerton doesn't have much of a tourist base. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As I'm sure yeah. Honolulu fills in a bit that way. Come on. Are you saying people don't want to come here for all the, <laughs> the great art? People that live here don't want to come here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I've been to Bremerton a few times, and it has always been to see people. Uh, MXPX likes it here. Fuck, come on. I they love it. Wrote about it. I, I used to make, I grew up on the other side of Seattle and I used to make fun of Bremerton and I lived here for 15 years and I love it. Yeah, really but weren't you from here. Kent? Uh, Issaquah. Oh God, the land of the blue eyeshadow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the electric it's blue eyeshadow. And you're talking trash about Bremerton. Town in, uh, in King County, actually. <laughs> Yeah, so regional issues here. All right, this Mm -hmm. is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so Amber, uh, what's your your background? Well, as I said, I'm from Issaquah. Um, My background (laughs) is uh, I actually grew up after after high school. I moved to Seattle, lived there for 15 years, and uh, worked in the restaurant industry. And uh, just out of you know necessity and a lot of traveling. But I've always been interested in science. So uh, eventually when I settled down and had my oats sewn, uh, I went back to uh, university and I got a bachelor's degree in botany. And I'm still working on my thesis for my master's in uh, science in the public from uh, SUNY Buffalo, which is actually a CFI program as well. Oh, cool. Uh, So that's what I'm doing right now. So basically I'm a science communicator, former scientist. I ran a an orchid lab for eight and a half years. And, uh, and now I'm just kind of working at being a better science communicator. And, uh, and I run uh, or organize um, Kitsap County skeptics and Kitsap atheists and agnostics uh, with Wes. 
um, which is actually kind of been a really successful enterprise, I think, here in this county uh, for people yeah. who don't feel um, very comfortable. I mean, Kitsap County is supposedly the the most atheistic county in the United States, though I think that people that live here probably don't really recognize that much because we do have so many military here. Yeah, um, I, it's just, it kind of blew my mind when they said that. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> but everybody in the Pacific Northwest is, well, pretty individualistic. We're not real joiners. So um, I think it's, I think most atheists in this, uh, in this neck of the woods are, uh, are pretty, you know, solitary and not, and not community focused. And I, and I we kind of had a, a, a dearth of people uh, or of uh, places for people who weren't churchgoers to uh, find community. And um, so Andrew Lindsay actually founded Kitsap Atheists. What was it? Five years ago, Wes? Yeah. Yeah. About uh, that. About five, five years ago, almost six, I guess. Um, and then he moved on and, and we took over and, uh, 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 uh he didn't <laughs> die. He just, he, you know, did. <laughs> he moved. He didn't shuffle off this mortal coil. Right. He, he moved to Bellingham. So hmm. he's still around, but. And, uh, were you raised religious? Um, hmm, that's hard to say. Um, yeah, <laughs> in many different ways. Um, uh, my mother married into, four or five different religions growing up. So right. we went to a lot of different churches. We went to Christian churches and Mormon churches and Catholic churches and Lutheran churches. Um, and I guess I could say I spent most of my childhood believing in a God or trying desperately to believe in a God. Um, it, just because that's what I was told, you know, you mm -hmm. were supposed to do. Um, but then after having seen all, been to all these different churches with, and every single church I walked into, I said something that had been told me at the previous church and the people at the new church said, oh, that's no, we don't believe that. <laughs> so that was a little hard to deal with. And then, um, in high school, uh, I actually got involved in young life, which is a oh, I think God, non denominational really? Christian youth group and i went to um camp malibu up in the queen charlotte islands up north in um in bc and it was amazing it was an amazing place and it, it was it was a lot of fun and i think it was directly after i got back from that that i realized that i couldn't believe <laughs> they kind of deconverted me and now nice. i realize that this is just really a place for rich white people's kids to go have a vacation. I mean, I have, I literally have friends that I went to high school with that are actively involved in this. And so I don't want to say anything bad about it because it wasn't a bad experience, but it was an incredibly privileged experience. Um, and then once I was no longer privileged, I kind of, kind of moved away from that. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> it's a, that's an interesting route to go on all of it. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. Uh, oh, well, after after I kind of became like emancipated, I guess you would say, uh, from my parents, um, and I didn't believe in God anymore, I kind of went on this journey to find out what was the truth. Um, hmm. So I went through everything that you can possibly think of, you know, Kabbalah and concentration and meditation and witchcraft and everything I could possibly get my hands on. I read because I thought, well, I desperately thought, well, something I have to believe in something and something has to be true. Um, and then I think I was, I don't know, in my mid twenties, I guess, when all of a sudden it occurred to me that I didn't have to believe anything. And then I, it was just like, this lifting of, you know, this huge lift off my shoulders of this weight off my shoulders that, oh, wow, you know, I don't have to believe anything. Like, there's no reason that I have to believe anything. I can just not believe in any of this stuff. And it was like. Pretty fucking refreshing. Everything was great after that. Yeah. <laughs> Why did I have to go through all this? Why didn't someone tell me this when I was 12? And the funny thing is, I don't think anyone in my family believes in anything <laughs> but it's like this social thing like 
everybody believes and it would be rude not to. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we'll just, you know, it, it was just like, we don't talk. I asked my mother once, probably in my early 20s, if she believed in God. She said, it's none of your business. <laughs> like, my family does not talk about really. It was just and I swear to God, so to speak. My grandmother is an atheist, but she will not admit it. <laughs> no. We just don't talk about it. It's whispered. Man, oh, wow. is your family from like the, the Northeast or something? Because that's the two things they don't talk about is like religion and politics. No, my grandmother was native. Um, and her was, mar- So she was born in Issaquah? No, 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 no. Um, in, the, <laughs> in the Midwest. Uh, in uh, in North Dakota, uh, and her it's her she married an Englishman, so her family wasn't happy. Well, her family wasn't religious, and they married, and they just kind of they moved off the reservation and passed. So they never really had a tradition of religion in the family. And we just there's a lot of things that we don't talk about in the family, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like not being white. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> not being religious all these things we don't talk about really you're, you're just about a, the whitest person i know i could not be whiter seriously yes yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is funny though all right so with the the science communicating is there uh any particular focus you're you're taking with it um well <sighs> I started out, I've been working on um, pro-science and mostly um, pro-genetic engineering for the last, gosh, I guess it's been about five years. Um, In answer to the weird, (laughs) I can only describe it as weird anti-GMO sentiment uh, that I, you know, came to realize eventually was an organic industry kind of uh-huh. propaganda thing um so they're they're industry shills oh well i don't think no no i mean i i want to be i want to be fair there is plenty of evidence that the organic industry designed the anti-gmo movement as a way to shut down basically genetic engineering and to increase organic industry profits i mean that's clear mm-hmm. however I don't think that the majority of anti-GMO people are shills at all. I think they truly believe that there is a, that there's a danger Mm. from these, from these scientific tools. I truly, and I truly believe that they believe that Monsanto is trying to control the world's food supply. I think they've been um, brainwashed basically into believing this. And, you know, six years ago, I was anti Monsanto. I thought, well, oh, look at the horrible things they've done. You know, I wasn't really anti genetic engineering, you know, my degrees in botany. So I, you know, I was kind of familiar with the, with the, uh, with the technology, but I, I, I believed it as well. And then I started looking into it and I was like, oh, wow, everything these people are saying is completely bullshit. I mean, there was just no truth to any of it. Um, so as I started looking into it more and more and more, then I started to recognize that this propaganda was working. Now, as a, you know, as a science communicator, it doesn't do me any good to say, well, the public are just scientifically illiterate. They don't know any better. Screw them. I mean, I, there's, I, that doesn't help. Um, so it's been kind of a it's been a concerted effort. Um, and is actually working now, which is kind of amazing, um, to just I- I introduce people to the technology and just okay, let's okay, let, let let's just say fine, Monsanto is evil. <laughs> let's set them aside for a second. Let's look at the technology. Let's look at the studies that that have been that have been done, mm-hmm. and and let's look at this from a non political point of view. And I find that. Often, if you can get people to set that hatred of Monsanto and all that stuff aside and look just look just at the technology, look just at how it's actually done, because a lot of people don't know how it's really done and they have weird ideas about that. And then the and then and then the studies that have been done, they start to say, 
and, and this is kind of the, and I've, I've seen this happen with hundreds of people. This is kind of how it goes. First, they go, oh, well, the technology isn't bad, but Monsanto is horrible. And why is it always only Monsanto? Because because I, I, I swear it's because it sounds like Satan. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that now, and Monsanto being the chemical company that they were 30 years ago did some really bad stuff. And then they were bought by, you know, two or three companies and then they were reorganized. And then this mo- the current Monsanto was spun off from another company. You know, it, it, it's dizzying thinking about how many things different things happened to get Monsanto from what it was in the 70s to what it is today. But it's a completely different company. However, when they took on the name Monsanto, and I have no idea why they did that because it was a stupid move. But when they took the name Monsanto on, they also took on the liability of the previous company. Oh yeah. So if people are suing Monsanto for stuff they did back in the 1970s, the current Monsanto company is is the one that they're litigating against. And that was dumb. Yeah. I don't know why in the world they did that. I think they thought that Monsanto is this, you know, really reputable company in the business world. People will, you know, will give us money if we have the same name. But it's a totally different company. Um, and and it actually, it's been so good for Bayer and <laughs> Pioneer, DuPont, and all these other companies that are working on the same things that Monsanto are working on. But nobody even has even heard of them. They don't care, so they're they're not going to say anything. They're like, well, "Yay, our competition is getting bad mouthed all the time." No Bayer problem. And DuPont, everybody knows about, just for different things. Sure, right, right. exactly. When, well, when you they got... even have Pioneer as the name for their seed company, their division. So. Mm-hmm. They but even need, keep DuPont when, off of that. Um, so, yeah, it's all, it's all this just crazy corporate stuff, which you can say or not, you know, may or may not have be an issue. Uh, but the technology itself <laughs> um, is as safe as conventional crops and has the potential has actually done quite a bit of good as far as, you know, uh, uh, raising profits for farmers and uh, enabling no-till um, agriculture, which is better for the environment, fewer inputs, greater yields. Um, so G technology is, 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 is really the technology of the future. It may overpromise sometimes. I'm not going to say that it's not. But we can't ignore this in- incredible tool in our toolbox when we're – 7.2 billion people heading into global warming that is going to basically screw us all. We have to use everything we can to feed everybody on the planet. And we can't just say, as I've heard people say, which is kind of disgusting, well, we just shouldn't have half the people on the planet. Okay, right. are you going to decide <laughs> who's going? Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> who's gonna, the people who's that dying? Here? Who's living? Okay. Monsanto, I, I just got to add, though, you know, those Vietnam vets and all those old baby boomers still kind of fucked it for us. At least the Monsanto name because of fucking Agent Orange. Yes. Well, Agent Orange was actually Monsanto was the company that came to the government and said that the um, that a pesticide that they were making, if they made it wrong, which they were making it wrong, had this um, byproduct, which was a Agent Orange. Uh-huh. And they were like, this is, you know, we have to stop. We need to let you know this is a bad byproduct and we can't do it. And the, and the government said, hey, wait a minute, we can use this. And they actually <laughs> um, contracted and required Monsanto to make Agent Orange along with seven or seven or nine. I can't remember. Different companies were making Agent Orange for the government. Um, so, uh, I mean, yeah, it was bad, but <laughs> they didn't really have a choice. And I hear a lot that um, uh, 2,4-D, which is the pesticide that they were trying to make that has the uh, the Agent Orange uh, byproduct, mm-hmm. is actually a decent pesticide, and they're starting to use it more because Roundup is becoming resistant. Uh, or herbicide, herbs are becoming, or plants are becoming herb, uh, resistant to Roundup. 2,4-D is a decent pesticide. If you make it properly, there is no Agent Orange, so it's not that big of a mm-hmm. deal. Um, but because this is all kind of wrapped up in this big conspiracy theory that Monsanto is making it is. So now people are saying that Roundup is Agent Orange. 
which oh, is goodness. completely ridiculous uh, as no no bearing in fact whatsoever. But you you see it a lot on, on with people who don't really know um, anything about genetic engineering, except that, you know, well, GE is bad because Roundup is Agent Orange. That's kind of how they look at it. Wow. It's a lot of lot of scientific ignorance out there. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. All right, let's let's play a little bit of, of role-playing on some of the more innocent arguments from the other side. Mm. Uh, and the first one's one I used to believe um, back when I was less educated on the topic. Uh, organic food's so much safer because it doesn't have pesticides and genetically engineered foods are just loaded with them. Uh, no, um, not true. Um, <clears throat> organic foods, organic agriculture is not safe, does not not use pesticides. It actually does use pesticides. Uh, but the only thing that you need in order for it to be an organic certified pesticide is that it's like from nature. But pyrethrin, for example, um, or um, Bordeaux mix, which is a carcinogen, or a rotenone is a uh, an organic pesticide. Now, rotenone is no longer al- allowed in the United States, but uh, the fact that something is an organic pesticide does not mean that it's safer at all. Uh, what matters is like it's LD50. Like, is it actually going to kill you if you use it or not? And the fact of whether or not it's an organic chemical or produced in a lab has absolutely nothing to do with that. Uh, one of the great things about Roundup is that you could be used. It will, you know, first of all, it's it's a it, it targets a, an amino acid uh, production path that isn't in humans. So it, it doesn't affect humans. It only affects plants. And um, so it, it's it's much safer in that way. Now, it, it, people always say, well, you douse things with Roundup. It's totally not true. You don't need very much Roundup uh, to work on a um, in a field. Uh, it's actually a very small concentration that's used. Well, and However, no farmer is going to use more than they need to because that's oh, expensive. absolutely not. Nobody is going to use more than they need to because the more you use, the more it costs. However, all pesticides, all herbicides, all insecticides have to work against evolution. You can't stop it. So, anything that you use by itself in in any amount to be a, to 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 get rid of pests eventually the pests are going to evolve a resistance to it there's nothing you can do about that so far i mean maybe there will be in the future but right now we are constantly just one step ahead of evolution so there are roundup resistant um uh, uh weeds now mm-hmm. um that doesn't mean we use more roundup though some people do. You're not supposed to. <laughs> well, it wouldn't do now, any good if they're resistant to it. doesn't do any good. You're going to use Roundup plus maybe 2,4-D together or another pesticide in conjunction with Roundup, Roundup. But the point of Roundup is, and everybody needs to understand this, the point of Roundup is that it enables no-till agriculture. You don't have to go in with a machine and thresh out the weeds, first of all. You can just you plant once everything comes up and it's at a certain it's at a certain height, you put Roundup on it one time and then maybe you do it one more time throughout the entire life of the crop rather than coming in with a fossil fuel generated machine or human weed pulling, which is obviously much more expensive. Um, And you and by not having to to. To put that uh, farm machinery over the top, you're also not disturbing the topsoil, so it retains moisture. Things don't you know, the the things that you're putting on the soil don't go so deeply into the groundwater because you're not tilling them in. Mm-hmm. It's actually it, organic is actually using no, no-till agriculture, it, it copying <laughs> copying what conventional farmers are doing because they realize that it's so much better for the environment. Now, I am not 
against organic agriculture at all. If organic methods work better with fewer inputs and a bit higher yield, I'm all for it. Anything that allows us to grow food for this planet that's better for the environment, I'm all for it. But and as I recall, problem, doesn't organic have a much lower yield? Much lower yield. Um, 20% less yield at the hi- at the highest yields huh. is organic. Now, wow. I, it's, I, I know there are people out there that are really into permaculture, and I've done some looking at permaculture. I haven't done a lot. I have not seen the kind of yields. It, it seems like this really labor-intensive... A uh, thing that may work out okay, but doesn't really translate to a big scale. I mean, we're feeding a lot of people. And what's permaculture? <laughs> permaculture is kind of the idea of mixing um, perennials and annuals together and things like nitrogen fixers with things that need nitrogen to kind of make these plantings work together. Um, but it, it, it's a great idea. I mean, it's like, it's basically the idea of taking your rainforest or jungle um, ecology and doing it with planting. But it doesn't seem to be translatable at this point to large scale plantings. So it's more of an idea of uh, moving maybe desolate landscapes into highly planted landscapes, which is great because, I mean, we all like to go to places that are you know, beautiful and, and, and planted and look, and look gorgeous. But when you're talking about harvesting food, unfortunately, farms aren't attractive. <laughs> They're just not. And, and there's not much you can do with a cornfield to make it beautiful, it, but you get a much higher yield out of a monoculture than you do out of any other kind of planting. So we're going to have to work with all these things and, and experiment um, but genetic engineering is the fastest, most accurate, targeted way we can find to get crops that work in an area where we need them to work. Like with, say, that need less water or less pesticide or less herbicide, or there's a pest that's there, like a, like a BT crop. Genetic engineering allows us to target exactly what we need in an environment put it there and grow more food in that environment. And we're the Gates Foundation is working on it in Africa. We're working on it here in the United States. Lots of people, not just Monsanto, tons of tons of labs are working on these things. Um, Then it's not a panacea. And a lot of people say, well, genetic engineering isn't a panacea. Therefore, no, it's not. I agree. But we can't just say we can't use this because the reasons for not using the using them are ridiculous and don't and not even true. Like there's 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 no evidence that genetically engineered crops are in any way the ones that are on the market are less safe than normal crops. It's basically, you know, Ludditism. <laughs> it's just fear of technology. All right, let's let's move to the next uh, along the role playing lines to to keep. Uh bringing up some of the specific uh, objections people have that the uh, the genes that are being added into these crops, uh, they might escape into the wild. Well, that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of a silly, <laughs> that's kind of silly, actually. Um, first of all, the biggest, I think, uh, thing that people think is like, you know, you hear this a lot. Well, there was a fish gene in the tomato, the, the Flavor Saver Tomato, which was the first genetically modified crop back in, oh gosh, uh, 94, 93 and 94. Uh, well, it's not a fish gene. <laughs> it's a gene that's found in fish. No gene belongs to any specific se- species. Genes are just genes. They're just codes, you know, sections of DNA that code for a protein. And we can find genes in certain things Um in certain organisms, but that doesn't make that gene intrinsic to that organism. It's just the gene that does this. So um, when you talk about genes escaping into the wild, now that's possible with closely related wild relatives. So in the case of say um, canola, there's a wild, uh, apparently the wild canola that grows in Canada 
is closely related to the c- cultivated canola. So they've had some problems with Roundup Ready wild canola variants. Mm. Very, uh, very, very, very possible for that to happen. But you have to remember that most cultivated crops don't grow in the wild and have never grown in the wild. Actually, there are no cultivated crops that have grown the way they are in the wild. Most cultivated crops have been bred for monoculture and live in a specific environment and can't live outside of it. They're really tender. They grow really well the way they w- we want them to grow. But outside of that, they don't grow very well. So if you were to start introducing genes into wild plants, that would be an issue. Like, well, here, for here, for example, kudzu, right? This is a huge problem throughout the South, this Japanese weed, kudzu. If you were to introduce a Roundup Ready kudzu, yes, that would probably be the end of the South. <laughs> <laughs> but, right. So why aren't we working on it now? Yeah, we should. Yeah, that could be like how we defeat our enemies. But conceivably, but, you yeah. could develop a genetically modified kudzu. Oh, absolutely. To wipe out Nobody's the kudzu Nobody's working there. on that. <laughs> but you Nobody's- could do it to try to wipe them out, like they're doing huh? with mosquitoes in uh, Brazil's market here, is putting that one out into the wild. Oh, the yes, the genetically en- engineered mosquitoes, which is a lovely idea. And they've done it, and it only affects... Uh, I've, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. It only affects the male mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. So they mate with the female ex- mosquitoes that are the biters. Yeah. So all of their offspring don't have the ability to carry the disease. I believe that's how it works. I, 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 I can't, I, not the top of my head, I can't remember. That remember particular one was ethically questionable because the, I think the males could, rep- the, the engineered males could reproduce, but their male offspring would be sterile. Right. And so right. the in theory, within like 15 generations, like you could, or a certain percentage of them would be sterile, not all, because then, you know, it it wouldn't be very effective. Uh, But theoretically, within like 10 years, you could completely wipe out the species. Right. Which can have implications, obviously. I mean, mosquitoes are part of an ecosystem. You can't just wipe them out. But it is the one species that has been identified or not. It's not even a species. There's tons of species of mosquitoes. Um, they're right. able to specifically target only one species, so there will be other mosquitoes that don't carry malaria. And uh, it's like the one group of animals that, out of all of them, if you got rid of them, nothing yeah. really would change. Right. So, well, yes, and that, and that's, and that's where you know, that's where people have to understand. And I hear that I hear this a lot from people who are, t- but you know, you know what scientists did that they screwed up on. 50 years ago, you know, Uh, yeah, we didn't think, we didn't think 50 years ago. Uh, We did a lot of stuff that we thought, oh, this could be great and didn't think about the consequences. We also didn't really have computers back then Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we didn't have modeling. So um, I'm not going to say that everything that every scientist comes up with now that they decide is a great idea is going to turn out fantastic because obviously we don't know, but this is an issue in Europe, the, the pre- precautionary principle that they use in Europe, in my mind, is kind of ridiculous because you have to look at foreseeable problems as a possibility and do what you can to mitigate them. But at a certain point, you have to just go with what you can do because you can't foresee every possible problem. The precautionary principle negates the ability to move forward. In a lot of ways. So if we were to say, um, if we were to have said, say, 25 years ago, my God, if we make these cell phones, people will stop talking to each other at restaurants and we'll just be looking down into these screens. We might have said, OK, we're not going to do that. That's terrible. We don't want we don't want that to happen. But think of all the things that wouldn't have happened if we had decided we're just not going to we're just not going to make cell phones or well, smartphones, personal, personal mobile so devices, information that, devices, whatever they are. Sure. So we can't 
we can't look at everything. You know, th- there's a saying that we had in, in when I worked at the lab, uh, the orchid lab I worked at, we worked in a laminar flow hood and it had to be sterile. We could not do any any work if it was sterile. Well, we didn't have any way in this particular head. We didn't have any way of knowing whether or not everything in there was sterile or not. We just had to go with best sterile practice and had to say, OK, now we have to assume this is sterile because if it's not sterile, we can't do any work. So there are certain assumptions that you have to make in science and you have to do a risk benefit analysis for these assumptions. But we have to assume to a certain extent that the reasonable precautions that we've taken with genetic engineering are enough to keep us from destroying the planet. But they're and also not just taking shots in the dark. I mean, these are educated exactly. people. We've done a lot of work and we've done, you know, you know, it's very possible that back in 1994 and 1995 and 1996, when these crops were first coming out, that there was something that could have gone wrong. Absolutely. It's absolutely possible. But we've now got 25 years of studies that have shown us we got lucky. <laughs> we probably didn't take some precautions we should have. We did find some stuff like there was a, uh, there was a, 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 there was a species. I can't remember what it was, but would they put a tree nut protein in that turned out to be an allergen? that nobody mm-hmm. thought of. And luckily they tested it, you know, cause they test these things on allergy. People say, gee, genetically engineered crops aren't tested. That's absolutely not true. They absolutely test them, but they tested it for an allergen and found out, Oh my gosh, this tree nut protein actually triggers these allergies. So there have been things that we've learned, but we can't as a species just shut down scientific endeavor because of things that may happen in the future. Um, we we kind of screwed up with fossil fuels. I mean, global warming is happening and we need to fix it. But think of the way that lives have improved through being able to fly an airplane across the country or, mm-hmm. you know, being able to plow fields with, you know, with uh, or any, anything that you can think of that you can do with a car or a plane or, air, or, a, or a motorcycle or all these things that have made life so much better. I mean, it, it enabled the industrial age. And we could have said, oh, my gosh, global one the, warming. One of the ways <laughs> we can fix years. that. One of the yeah. ways we can fix that is with genetic engineering. They've made Absolutely. algaes that can produce oil within two years. Absolutely. Uh, we. I am. I'm fairly. There's one thing that I believe with very little evidence there. The, my my one. Uh, I believe that we will be able to out technology just about every problem we have. Um, the, you know, I, I can't say like, oh, I have all this evidence we can do it, but I've just, I've seen, I've seen what humans have been able to do in the last 200 years. And I'm like, people are pretty smart. I mean, even if the majority of people aren't really smart, <laughs> there are enough smart people on the planet that I think we're going to get out of this. I don't know. Now, now you're getting into dangerous territory. You're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're starting to sound like you're going to out technology God. <laughs> I think we've already done that. <laughs> goodness yeah there there are a lot of problems that we can we can fix with technology a few that Let, will be quite a few years till we get there but yeah if you like this show consider giving us some financial support to make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode monthly or even annual basis using paypal or patreon find out more at atheistnomads.com use the links on the right side of the page one dollar an episode is all we ask please think of the kittens let's take a, a slightly different uh, look at this uh, can you tell me how many companies monsanto has sued over the years for anything really oh well individual, uh, like any farmers I don't know about companies um individuals i believe there have been mm. i know they have sued like off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly how many. I believe they've sued less than like 10 people a year. And I think that only 12 or 13 lawsuits have gone to trial. Um, whereas you think like a company like Apple, they sue, sue like 100 people a year easily. Um, but that, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. 
Wes, is that people say, oh, Monsanto sues people all the time. That's actually right. not true. Oh. Um, they don't sue very many people. They never lose because they don't sue anyone unless they can lose or unless they can win. That's kind of like one of their it's like the Powell doctrine, like going with overwhelming force. Yeah, they don't sue anyone unless they know they're going to win the lawsuit. So they don't sue very many people. They only sue when they find that someone has breached their contract or is stealing seed, which people do, Mm -hmm. and they know that they're going to win. The funny thing, is, the people thing that people don't realize about Monsanto is if they sue a farmer for breaching their contract, then, and I should explain that uh, ahead of time. When you purchase Monsanto seed, you have a contract that you will plant the seed that year and you will sell off the crop that comes from that resulting plant. And you will not sell, you will not replant the seed that comes from that crop. Say you won't take three rows of corn and grab that and use it for seed corn the next year. Now that wouldn't, that's kind of a silly um, example because you can't really plant for, for other reasons. You can't really plant this corn for the next year, but let's just say some other crop. You can't take the seed and plant the crop the next year. Now there's two reasons for this. First, the seed that Monsanto sells has a patent on it and they don't allow you to reuse the seed because it's patented. And they are the only people that are allowed to sell and reuse that seed. The second reason they do it is for quality control, because especially in the in the case of corn, you can't plant out the second generation and have it come up with the same traits as the first generation. So Hmm. if you're planting something um, and it it turns out great and you're like oh my gosh this is the best crop of anything i've ever had i'm going to save the seeds from this and plant the next generation the next generation may not breed even true you may end up with really funky looking stuff that's just kind of a botany thing so um those are the two reasons they don't do it now however roundup ready is a great trait right i mean Think of how much money you save if rather than having to go through and pick weeds or till under weeds, as you might have to, you just have to go and spray Roundup and all the weeds are gone. I mean, that's like a miracle. That's how Roundup has become this huge thing since the night. I think it was 1978 when Roundup was first uh, introduced. It's awesome. You come in, you spray down, spray it down. The, uh, all the weeds die. Then you then you then you take this gene that's resistant to that's Roundup resistant, and you introduce it in your in your crop, and you could just spray it right in your crops, and your crops don't die, die, but the weeds do. That's genius. I mean, they deserve to make a gazillion dollars on that. That's a great thing. Yeah. So people that are having to spend the money using conventional seed and having to spend the money to till out weeds or hand pull weeds or whatever they have to do, if they can take that seed and plant it and not have to pay the premium on that they're saving a lot of money but they're not paying the person that spent all the money to come up with the seed so they actually the people that get caught stealing from monsanto are caught because their neighbor farmers rat on them (laughs) and wouldn't you because you're paying this premium $20 a bag on seed for this great seed. And the guy in your next farm is going to sell the same crop, but he's not paying Monsanto for the licensing for that, for that trait. I mean, that's not fair. So Monsanto will come in and they will test your field. And there are plenty of, of, uh, of studies out there showing how much, just regular cross pollination happens between fill fields two three kilometers away whatever it is and if they see that your farm your field which is supposedly your own seed is 90 percent roundup resistant but you haven't purchased anything from monsanto they know you're stealing seed it's it, it's not a coincidence it's not cross pollination they know that you're stealing it and then they can sue you and win if you've got a few Roundup ready plants around the edges of your field, 0.2, 0.3%, which is normal cross-pollination, mm-hmm. 
-hmm. They'll not only not sue, sue you, they'll come in and remove it and pay you for what you lost in your field. Mm -hmm. And if they do, this is this is what I love about Monsanto, even though, you know, I love the fact that a company like and people can look this up there. They've won so many um, awards as great uh, employers of scientists. They're they, like diversity awards. They, it's it's really amazing. I heard but they're an really amazing company about, to work for. Sorry. I heard they're an amazing company to work yes, for. Yes, absolutely. I've never heard from anyone who are from Monsanto that didn't say, wow, this is they're like the best company I've ever worked for. Hmm. Middle class wages um, and incredible diversity awards. They have the I think they have the most female members of their executive team on, of any company. Uh, they win awards in these things all the time. But the cool thing is if they sue someone because they've been stealing seed, they take the money they win in the lawsuit because they always win and they put it towards a fund to provide um, college students with scholarships to go into agriculture. Wow. Oh, nice. And they're not like taking this money and like, you know, rolling around jetting right? off to Hong Kong for, you know, for champagne on New Year's Eve. They're reinvesting the money into the communities of the people that they're actually like taking, you know, the people that are stealing from them. They're like, we're just going to take this money and we're going to invest it in. Cause uh, there are so many people think farmers are just like rubes. There are so many farmers out there with masters and PhDs in agriculture. No, it, fuck. It, science is, or farming is turning into a science hella quick. Absolutely. And, and Monsanto is facilitating that by, penalizing people who steal from them. <laughs> yeah. I think it's amazing. Now, I have met a, a farmer who was a complete rube, and I was terrified <laughs> that he was using GMOs because we, Lauren and I were, were headed across Oregon, and we were at this little diner, and he was in the, the next booth and talking about you now these new crops he's using. They're just so great. They're, they're GMO. Uh, it's, it's general modified. I have no idea what the O is. And I let Aww. him kind of stammer for about 30 seconds. And I said, genetically modified organism. It's like, that makes sense. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> and it was like, oh my, this guy, if he doesn't even know what it is, he doesn't understand what he's using, what are the odds that he's going to do it right? I'm not saying all farmers are geniuses. <laughs> I'm just saying the farmers that I've met, the farmers that I talk to every day, um, you know, maybe maybe a little more technologically savvy because I talk to them on the Internet um, are really smart people. And a lot of them have degrees. And it, 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 we get this, especially from the anti-GMO uh, uh, movement, this idea that farmers are being tricked into using GMO seed, and it's so ridiculous. Of course, they're not. They're going to use whatever best for their business. Yeah. Well, in, in that farmer in the in the diner, he didn't understand what he was using, but even though it costs a lot more money, it improved his profitability. So he was all for it. He absolutely loved it. Yeah. Well. Go. I would too. I mean, farmers have always, I mean, that's the reason for, you know, farm subsidies. They've always worked on a, on a razor thin margin. It's very hard to make a profit in farming and um, genetically engineered crops have totally allowed people to do this. I mean, I know there are farmers out there who are like, I'm not going to use them. I'm an organic farmer. This is what I'm going to do. And I, I, it's fine with me. If people want to grow organic, I'm not, all that ethically cool with them using up extra land, but whatever. If they can charge a premium for their crops, go go ahead, do that. What I'm not okay with is vilifying GMOs in order for them to make a profit. Like saying, well, genetically engineered crops are dangerous, therefore you need to buy more my organic crops. That's not okay. It's it's mm -hmm. it's it's a crappy business pro uh, uh, practice, and it's um. It's unethical as far as I'm concerned. I just don't want to see people be shills for big orga or big Whole Foods. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy that owns Whole Foods is really a dick. So <laughs> nobody <laughs> should go there. <laughs> but that's oh, kind man. of a different thing. I, I, <laughs> that store is filled with woo. It's crazy. 
<laughs> and so is PCC. Oh my goodness. Have you ever been in there? I, I can't I will I, say I have friends that have worked for PCC. The people that own PCC, from what I understand, are really great people and they really take care of their employees. And as far I as no I'm doubt. concerned, if you take care of your employees and you're not unethical, <laughs> I'm cool <laughs> with that. Just don't lie to people. You know, if you want to charge more, I mean, like I'm, I'm a huge union supporter. Charging more to take care of your employees to me is really important. Oh, I, sh I shop at Fred Meyer and yep. not Walmart for a reason. <laughs> well, I shop at, at, um, oh God, what is that place so close to you? Um, Winco. Oh no, Winco. Yeah. yeah. It's a horrible place. It kind of is, but you know, it, it's. <laughs> they are employee owned based out of Boise and at least the, the Winco here, uh, they have the happiest most efficient and productive employees I have seen at any retail establishment. Definitely not the case here. They're also <laughs> the best paid. Now, the Winco here has been here forever uh, since it, it, you know, it started here. So most of the employees working there, uh, the company has a, a base starting wage of, I think, $11 an hour. Most mm. of the cash, the cashiers, again, at least here, are making 25 an hour. Shit. Because they, once you get hired... Government job. Once you get hired on there, people don't want to leave because they just keep getting raises and they get to buy into the company. And most people who retire from there retire as millionaires. Huh. Well, I am a huge Costco, Costco fan, which yeah. I, you know started here at, at Kirkland, Washington, Issaquah. I think it was Kirkland. Um, uh, and I, I, I'm a fan of employee-owned businesses, absolutely. But the Winco <laughs> in our town... It, it's nope. sad, but <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I knew I, <laughs> this is a horrible story. I'm going to tell you the story. The <laughs> third or fourth time I ever went to Winco, I walked out into the parking lot to go to my car and there was a guy sitting in the parking lot eating chicken wings, like in, in his car and throwing the bones out onto the, <laughs> well, why are you calling me out like this? Done. And I was like, I can't shop here anymore. <laughs> why Why the fuck are you calling me out like this? <laughs> it wasn't Wes. He it, did vaguely resemble Wes, but it wasn't Wes. Um, I like my chicken wings. No, Come on. I love the idea of Winco. I love the idea of an employee-owned um, grocery store, but it has not translated in Bremerton. <laughs> that's <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> now, have you only been that one time? No, no, no. It's my local grocery store. I go there all the time because I'm I'm kind of forced to because it's close. <laughs> um, nobody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. Nobody, nobody, and it may be that the employees aren't happy because of the customers that are in there. That's perfectly possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Wow, we got way off on a tangent. <laughs> And that's just fine. Yeah. See, that's what the show is. Doing a lot of editing. Uh, one thing I do want to go back to is, is Whole Foods. I got drug into the Whole Foods here <laughs> one time. Fortunately, it's only been one time. And it was a shocking and horrifying experience, uh, especially eating food from the deli. I looked at the label on the sandwich I got and like every single ingredient had words whole organic or natural on it and or non-gmo in quotes or oh that was listed brackets. on there i think five or six times at various yeah. places <laughs> not I, I think only once or twice actually in the ingredients list but the ingredients list alone could have been so much shorter if they just wait removed all the superfluous language and but it's a selling point. I mean, it is the yeah. organic. If the organic industry realized, uh, I don't know, ten or fifteen years ago, um, that they couldn't compete with, um, they couldn't compete with conventional agriculture, um, and so they had to do something special. And 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 what that special was was to say organic is safe and pesticide free. Things that aren't true, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, now there are things about, there are things about organic agriculture that 
are actually kind of interesting if you're a wealthy person with extra money to spend <laughs> and privileged. One nice thing about, and you can actually see this in uh, in farmer's markets that aren't even organic, but if you're not concerned about your cost per yield, if you can add 20 to 25% premium to what you're selling, you're able to grow um, varieties that taste better or maybe are more colorful. For example, I am a huge fan of chard. It's my favorite vegetable in the world. Um, you can get red chard conventionally all the time. Uh, rainbow chard is beautiful and tastes better, but you can generally only find it organic. I will actually spend the extra 50 cents to get rainbow chard just because of the way it looks. And there are several different, you know, varieties, uh, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, like tomatoes. We have so many, you know, we don't we don't have the kind of for the most part until this year, the kind of um, climate that allows us to grow just conventional tomatoes. We have to grow specific tomatoes here um, that work for our climate. And some of them are really cool and and beautiful, but you can't get the kind of yield in those tomatoes that you could, you know, that you can in a hothouse. These are tomatoes that are grown just from my backyard. So that's one great thing about organic. They, they can charge a premium so they can grow these cool, good looking, good tasting, different varieties of things that you can't grow if you're like your livelihood depends on feeding people, you know, organic has that, that kind of like that, that luxury, mm -hmm. which is great. If you have a lot of money and you live in a, in a, a wealthy society that can pay for these things. Um, An but, echo chamber that reinforces the need right, for organics. But then if you take that, well, this is so much better attitude. And then you, and then you try to apply it to feeding the entire world. Well, at that point, you've you've crossed an ethical line because I don't think that a person starving in Africa gives a shit if they can get rainbow chard. They just yeah. want something to eat. And that's where we generally in the U.S., especially and unfortunately also in Europe as a society really fall down Um is is like trying to impose our like arbitrary this is okay rules on the entire planet europe is is a horrible example of this like they're just absolutely thrilled to say no gmos when there are people starving in europe i mean it, 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 it's it, a lot of a lot of european countries are socialist and people are doing well but there are still people starving <laughs> you still need to feed people and if we're saying well we're not going to allow this cheap food into our country because it's not good enough for us how can how can you how can you defend that i don't think you can yeah i also want to loop back on that a little bit uh <clears throat> like the washington states 522 uh gmo labeling i, th I think that's a, a giant tactic that well, big orga used to kind of put the fear into people about GMOs. Absolutely. I worked on that quite a bit. Uh, what was that? Two years ago? Yeah. About. Two years ago. Um, I worked, I should say I worked against that quite a bit um, because yeah, it, it, you're basically putting a surcharge on food for people because you don't think it's good enough when there's no scientific um, evidence that there's anything wrong with it. And, you know, there are a lot of really privileged people in, in Washington, um, especially in the uh, in the King County, Kitsap County corridor, that whole area there. So there's there's a lot of people who are, are are not suffering and who are willing to put farmers out of business um, in the eastern Washington, which is where most of our farms are um, and and make poor people pay more for food. It's just kind of crazy. Yeah, because yeah, ultimately the the whole point of it would be to shift the middle class to buying organic food and drive up the price of the the alternative. Well, their 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 point is to actually drive the alternative out of business. I mean, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. There are sev- sev- several um, quotes. And you can find it on the Genetic Literacy Project website. Um, several quotes from people working for the organic foods industry who came right out and said that labeling uh, legislation is specifically designed to drive genetically mm-hmm. modified crops out of the industry. Because yeah, if, if you can shift the demand, they'll uh, shift the prices. They'll bring, probably not really bring down the price of organic food, but it will raise the price of conventional foods. And as soon as the prices reach near parity, everybody's going to just be buying organic. Well, um, the prices that the thing about labeling, the thing about labeling that a lot of people don't think about, and this is, you know, it was kind of a, it's kind of a, a difficult thing to explain to people is they're like, what? It's just putting a label on it. There's already labels on food. All you have to do is put a label on it that says may contain GMOs or contains GMOs. But what they don't understand is um, we have very sensitive tests now to, to, to discover uh, genetically modified um, uh, genes in, in, in foods. And this has been a problem with our, with, with exports as we can now discover down to like 0.01%. So that means that in order for something to be like confirmed as not genetically modified, it has to be able to pass this test. So that means you have to have completely separate production streams. You have to have silos that only hold GE grain and then silos with conventional grain. And you have to have uh, production facilities that only deal with GE ingredients and those that either that or you have to go through and clean and bleach everything in between in, in between shipments, mm-hmm. which is insane. You, you couldn't do that. So we're not just talking about the cost of a label. We're talking about a cost of taking a single production stream and separating it into two production streams and then the cost of litigation if you happen to mingle the two. So it's not, it, it, it's an incredible cost to, to do this. It's not just the cost of a label. It's huge. Um, and so I have always maintained that there are voluntary labeling schemes. The GMO free project voluntarily labels. If you can prove to the GMO free project that your uh, item is GMO free, they will label it. And it's right there on the label or organic, for example, organic can't be GMO either. So if you see either of those labels, you're guaranteed to have whatever you have as GMO free. Why would you pass this cost on to other people if that's what you're concerned with. You can buy GMO-free labeled stuff. Why are you forcing people who might be living on food stamps to pay for your issue with GMO foods? Fucking I. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to throw my, my two cents in on Whole Foods just because <laughs> fuck it. <clears throat> I, for my ex-girlfriend few years back her birthday she wanted a cake from whole foods and i'll be goddamn if it wasn't the driest nastiest <laughs> fucking chocolate cake i don't and they said it was chocolate i could not i could not even i'm kind of gagging in the back of my mouth right now thinking <laughs> about this dog shit pile of brown thing that was sat in front of me god anyways well that's why she's an ex-girlfriend last yes <laughs> And why I have the most wonderful girlfriend now. You do. Absolutely. 100% agree with you there. All right. Shifting gears a a little (laughs) bit. Have you seen, because like two of the most awesome vaccines uh, we've, we've had in, in recent years have been genetically produced using genetically modified organisms. Mm -hmm. Uh, The most recent one being the Ebola vaccine. And another really awesome one is the hepatitis B vaccine. Have you seen any, like direct overlap between anti-GMO food and anti-vax movements, or has it just been the same kind of mindset? No, I haven't seen that, but there's a definitely an overlap in that mind mindset. I mean, there is definitely an over- overlap between people who believe vaccines are bad and who believe that GMOs are bad. And they're also the kind of people who believe in chemtrails 
and that 9-11 was an inside job. Um, I kind of tend to look at um, anti-GMO specifically as being like where the crazy far right and the crazy far left kind of meet around the middle in the back. Like they're anti-corporate, anti-government kind of mingle back mm-hmm. there. Um, as far, but but I don't think that these people realize that insulin is GMO or that most of the cheese that they eat has GMO run it. I don't think that people really have that much information because because and and it, it's something that I that I probably should have brought up earlier um it, which is a really good thing and I'm, I'm really I'm really happy to see this. 5 or 6 years ago when I was when I was starting to communicate on this issue you just you just got pummeled if you were pro GMO or pro pro science in this in this area. If you went to any website with a with comment section, ninety five to one hundred percent of the comments were anti GMO, anti technology. Just just it was really really bad and very de- and very defeating. It felt it felt bad and it, it and I worked really hard and I, I just felt like we're just losing. And I felt like that for a really long time. In the last year, especially in the last two years, but in the last two years, I've seen a lot of people move into this science communicate science communication in this area. But in the last year, especially, if you go to any website where they do a where they do an, an article about GMOs, mm-hmm. well over half of the comments now are pro science. Mm, nice. And I would never have believed that five years ago. I mean, I thought we were just, I thought, I thought this was the end. I thought we were going to completely get rid of genetically engineered crops. That it just wasn't going to happen. And that, that the fear that has taken over basically and, and made Europe into a non GMO. I mean, it's not banned anywhere, but it, it, it's difficult to, it's, it's ruined a lot of their, their farming, especially in Italy, uh, Scotland uh, is actively working to ban it. Yeah, so they're they're definitely they're 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 like their farmers are like going out of business in huge numbers because they can't grow these crops. Um, I thought that's where we're going, and the I have all new like hope <laughs> for the American public learning science because people are really getting it. I mean, we've made a huge difference. It's unbelievable. We've defeated almost every labeling scheme. I think Connecticut and Vermont are the only two states I can think of off the top of my head that that have actually passed. And Connecticut, they can't use it until every state around them is also anti-GMO. So Vermont is really the only place um, where this is where this is working. And of course, they have a huge organic industry, so that makes sense. But um, I see us winning on this. I'm like, I, 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 I would never have said it five years ago. I would have thought we were doomed. But I, I see science winning on this issue. And I see the United States, um, and especially I should give a shout out to the Gates Foundation because they're doing so much work uh, in Africa on this. Um, I, I see the U.S. like really leading in this. And even though China has been a little bit of an asshole <laughs> about <laughs> about um, refusing shipments, the reason that China is doing that is because they're working on their own genetically modified crops that they want to be able to. I mean, they're being protectionist. It has nothing to do with technology. Um, but I see us winning. I'm not I'm no longer worried. I was worried five years ago. I'm not worried anymore. Nice. And we are actually out of time. And that's a very happy note to end on. Yay. Fucking hey. <laughs> and you thought we'd only make like 10 minutes. <laughs> no, I said five. Or, oh, yeah. I said 10. All right. Do you have anything you want to plug? Yeah. Websites, moment, anything? I don't. I, I, w- I will have something to plug, but I don't want to really plug it right now. <laughs> well, other, other actually, uh, like science communication websites or anything. I, I actually, okay, I will actually plug a future project that I'm working on that hasn't started yet, but I will oh plug my. it because I actually need help with this project. Mm. Um, 
though my uh, focus in skepticism has been on science communication, uh, one of the problems that I've seen um, in science education is the proliferation of documentaries that are bullshit. So I am starting, will be starting within the next month or so, a a website where it will be a documentary review website where I'll be asking skeptics to watch documentaries and basically sit with them with a yell. This is what I do. I sit with a documentary with a legal pad and I write down all the logical fallacies as I go through and all the ways they've used appeal for, to emotion and all of the manipulative, the manipulative things people do in documentaries and I want to have a website where we all get together and kind of a clearinghouse for that. So if you watch this documentary, for example, Food Inc., which is a horrible documentary, <laughs> I want a website where people, skeptics, can go and say, okay, this is what's wrong with this documentary. Before you watch it, these are the things you should look for. Because I think that people have, you know, I, I'm actually a huge fan of Michael Moore as a comedian, not so much as a documentarian, but... I think since it, it, when he started with Roger and me was a great thing. It was kind of a f fun way of, of looking at politics and, 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 and like making people think. But I think this has gone like way too far. People now look at documentaries and they think what they see is reality. And I think it's really important that we have a place where people can go before they see one and they can say, OK, what are the facts in this case? For example, the Brzezinski documentary. Uh, what are the facts in this case before I watch this so I can I can know whether or not I should be swayed by this information? So I'm going to be starting that. Uh, but that's the only thing I really have to plug right now. <laughs> okay. And uh, it, if anybody wants to get involved, how can they uh, contact you? Uh, they can contact me at Amber, on Twitter at Amber Sherwood K. Awesome. And we'll have that link in the show notes. Thank you. Amber, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yay. This has been uh, well overdue. And for our listeners, we'll be back next week with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomad.